All right, so we have three speakers today. Uh, ben Katunak Charles is the Coastal Monitoring Community Outreach Manager at the Inuit Circumpolar Council, Alaska. At ICC, Ben assists in the development and implementation of the Coastal Biodiversity Monitoring Plan. Kathy Kuhn is a policy analyst at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. She's also the co-lead for the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program and a co-lead of IRPIC's Marine Ecosystems Community of Practice. Ntaze Jones is a regional coastal ecologist at the National Park Service. He co-leads and co-leads the Circumpolar Mon Biodiversity Monitoring Program's Coastal Steering Group and is also the co-lead of IRPIC's Coastal Resilience Community of Practice. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll hand it over to Ntaze to kick us off. Wonderful, thanks. As we uh, start to get this kind of pulled up and, and going, I just want to say thanks to everyone for, for coming. And um, we will go ahead and, and move forward through this. And we'll be sharing our, we'll be, we'll be going through one presentation, but kind of sharing the screen, um, sharing the, the time between the three of us. And, and so you'll hear us pass it off kind of back and forth between each other. So we'll be talking about the, the coastal um, implementation of the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program and the presentation topics that we'll kind of be walking through, uh, kind of just to give everyone a picture of the setting that we're working in. Then we'll walk a little bit through the plan and how we are intending to move forward and then some of the methods and the next steps. And then we'll move into a time for any questions that people may have. With that being said, um, we'll go ahead and start with the setting and I will pass this over to um, Kathy to talk a little bit about the setting. Yeah, thanks Taze. And it's really nice to see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces out there too. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm gonna kick us off and talk about the setting. It's gonna be like at this high 30,000 foot level. And I'm gonna tell you guys that the Arctic Research and Policy Act or ARPA defines the Arctic as all U.S. foreign territory north of the Arctic Circle and all U.S. territory north and west of the land boundary formed by the Porcupine, Yukon, and Kuskokwim rivers and all contiguous seas, including the Arctic Ocean, the Aleutian Islands, the Bering Sea, and the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. Um, it's this picture on the map that we have shown here. And it's Alaska that makes the U.S. an Arctic nation. And as a country, we participate in the Arctic Council. Next. The Arctic Council is an intergovernmental forum. It was formally established in 1996 and designed to promote cooperation, coordination, and interaction among the Arctic states, Arctic indigenous peoples, and other Arctic inhabitants on common Arctic issues. There is a recognized focus on issues of sustainable development and environmental protection in the Arctic. There are eight member states which represent all of the countries that have territorial boundaries within the Arctic. Um, just as a side note, there was a strategic pause on the Arctic Council in March of 2022 by the seven um, Arctic countries uh, due to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And currently there's a limited resumption of work on council projects that do not involve Russia's participation. Um, but Norway is currently the uh, chair of the Arctic Council overall. But really important to note is um, the right hand slide here is there are six permanent participant organizations representing the indigenous peoples with homelands that encompass portions of the Arctic. Permanent participants are an integral part of the council ensuring the voices of Arctic indigenous peoples are heard when decisions and initiatives are discussed and implemented. And uh, Katanak today will be presenting on behalf of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Next slide. Within the Arctic Council, there are six working groups focused on addressing the issues identified by senior Arctic officials at the Arctic Council level. Most of these working groups focus on environmental protections with one group focusing on sustainable development. The Department of Interior bureaus, including National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management and BOEM have participated in most of these working groups in various ways. Uh, today we'll be focusing on an initiative within the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna Working Group. Um, from here on out, we'll just refer to it as CAF. Um, next slide. CAF's themes of work focus on species and habitat management and utilization to share knowledge on management techniques and regulatory regimes and to facilitate more knowledgeable decision-making. 
It provides a mechanism to develop common responses on issues of importance for the Arctic ecosystem, such as development and economic pressures, conservation opportunities, and political commitments. But in a nutshell, CAF's primary focus is Arctic biodiversity conservation and sustainability of Arctic's living resources. Next. One of the flagship initiatives of the CAF is the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program. Uh, we call it CBMP. And this is a network of network of sciences and programs to improve detection and understanding and reporting of Arctic biodiversity trends. CAF is led uh, by a board compromised of representatives of all members of the Arctic Council. And CBMP is broadly, um, has a broad strategy that the CAF uses to accomplish its conservation purposes. And it's broken um, across by four um, steering groups um, across four ecosystems. And that's the terrestrial, freshwater, marine, and then coastal. And the coastal environment is where the other three come together. Uh, the, just as a side note, the coastal group was the last one that was formed in 2015, almost a decade after the marine group started. And I'll let Tazi take it from here and tell us a little bit more about it. All right, thanks, Kathy. Yeah, so within the coastal group, we had our monitoring plan that was published in 2019 with the implementation plan that was published in 2020. And the group itself is co-led by myself and Donald McLennan from, uh, from Canada. So the, the coastal monitoring group structure really kind of breaks down into what's below this dotted line here. And that's a coastal steering group with an indigenous knowledge network kind of <clears throat> embedded completely within the coastal steering group. The coastal steering group itself is uh, represented from Canada, the kingdom of Denmark, um, which, which encompasses Greenland, Iceland, Norway, the Russian Federation and the United States. So in, in the pause that happened that was associated with a combination of both uh, COVID and uh, the hostilities in Ukraine, um, that sort of led us to focus work within um, developing our coastal expert network within the United States. And that also uh, involves the, the full development of the implementation plan for the United States within Alaska, which will then be um, broadened a little bit further as we uh, hopefully um, in the near future begin to re-engage on this particular project more broadly. So that's kind of a picture of the background and setting where we are. And we're gonna kind of jump into a little bit about the plan and, and, and how that plan uh, is really focused and coming to be. And, and for that, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Katanek. Thank you, Tazi and Catherine uh, for providing that very important background on the Arctic Council, in, in particular, the CAF. Um, very quickly, I just wanna say thank you to everyone that has attended and is attending this uh, presentation on the coastal monitoring plan. And very quickly, no language concepts images should be taken uh, from this portion of the presentation without direct permission from anyone certain board council. Uh, next slide. Uh, just provide a little background about what Inuit Circumpolar Council is. Uh, Inuit Circumpolar Council or ICC strives to strengthen unity. Um, give me one second among Inuit of the Circumpolar, promote Inuit rights and interests at the international level and develop and encourage long-term policies that safeguard the Arctic environment and seek full and active partnership in the political, economic, and social development of the Circumpolar North. ICC represents the interests of all Inuit and we have offices in four Arctic regions, Chukotka, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. And we are one people in a single homeland across the Arctic, Inuit Nunat. Next slide. ICC was founded in 1977 by the late Eben Hobson of Utyagvik. And I, since then, ICC has flourished and grown into a major international indigenous peoples organization 
representing approximately 180,000 Inuit of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and Chukotka, or Russia. ICC currently holds non-governmental status, sorry, non-governmental organizational consultative status to with the United Nations Economic and Social Council and is a registered uh, organization with numerous UN specialized agencies and bodies. And just like Catherine has said earlier, ICC is also a permanent participant of the Arctic Council. And next slide. Here in Alaska, ICC is um, a 501c3 and exists as a unified voice and collective spirit of Alaskan Inuit to promote, protect, and advance Inuit culture and society. And we have four distinct regions in Alaska, and that's the Southwest, the Northwest, Bering Strait, and the North Slope. Next slide. Just like Tazi had mentioned earlier, Inuit Circumpolar Council made a strategic decision to focus its efforts within CAF, and in particular in the Coastal Biodiversity Monitoring Plan, because it was just getting started. Uh, because of the interest of Indigenous knowledge for the plan's development. And so ICC is now assisting in aiding the federal government in implementing the plan here in the US through the facilitation of the meaningful engagement of Inuit in our four regions. And through this, these facilitated engagement gatherings or meetings, we will develop the Coastal Expert Network. Next slide. And it's important to understand the beginnings of the plan itself. The plan came to an agreement through the steering group with the intention of using the food security conceptual framework um, that was published by Inuit Circumpolar Council. And it is a comprehensive tool from an Inuit perspective on how to assess the Arctic from indigenous knowledge holders, in particular from in ICC's regions. Within that plan, there are distinct and unique dimensions and drivers that were identified. These also correlate to the plan's uh, parameters and attributes which Tazi will explain later on in the presentation. But this tool provides guidance on how to assess the Arctic from food security lens, or in this case, a food security insecurity lens, um, if we were to assess it in that manner. Next slide. The six dimensions that are outlined in, the, in that publication are the availability, Inuit culture, decision-making power and management, health and wellness, stability and accessibility. And under those dimensions, there are 58 unique drivers uh, that either impact or affect uh, food security. And the plan itself was developed with these dimensions and drivers in mind. Next slide. Now, core to the plan is indigenous knowledge and the engagement of indigenous knowledge holders to provide a holistic knowledge system for this plan when assessing the health of the arctic in particular coastal ecosystems and the identified species the indigenous knowledge holders that will become part of this plan through the coastal expert network will provide the context and the analytical review to holistically assess the arctic from an indigenous knowledge holder perspective. Now this was the plan platform for the coastal monitoring plan itself, which is important. The next slide. Now the indigenous knowledge holder role and indigenous knowledge whole, whole knowledge, knowledge role is to help identify baseline data in providing the, that content and that analytical review uh, from documented information, public information, so science and indigenous knowledge, or both working together and providing a baseline for a database, or in this case, knowledge map. And the key species that are identified in the plan itself are focal ecosystem components, 
and the various parameters and attributes that are, are associated and identified in that plan. And they include phenology, harvest and accessibility, demography, diversity, body condition, behavior, ecology, to name a few. And next slide. And permanent participants implementation of the plan in assisting the US government, which includes Inuit Circumpolar Council and the Allied International Association or AIA, is to assist in coordinating and harmonizing these efforts through the facilitation of our Indigenous knowledge holders to holistically approach and assess coastal ecosystems and the species that are utilizing these ecosystems and developing reports from a holistic food security lens. But really the importance of the Indigenous knowledge holders implementation of the plan is to really provide that holistic understanding and holistic monitoring of, of the efforts that are being made through these various tools that are informed by Indigenous knowledge and the co-production of knowledge with Indigenous knowledge and science working together, hand in hand. Next slide. And I think that's it. So thank you. Pass back up to Charles there. All right, thank, thank you for that. And um, I do want to kind of stress a couple a couple points here. Uh, one is that from the very beginning of the development of this plan, uh, Indigenous knowledge holders were a participant in every step of the development of the plan. So we actively began looking um, and trying to ensure that we had from the from the very get go that we had engagement and participation. And so as as this plan has kind of moved and, and progressed, um, there's been growth and development that we that we've certainly had. Um, we've had to kind of take a look back and see where are we making you know our mistakes and how are we going to move forward. And I'll talk about that a little bit in in the progress and as we as we get kind of forward here a little bit. Um, but the other the other I think important piece is that um, as as was brought up with uh, in, in Kathy's talk there are Kathy's piece of the talk there are several. Indigenous organizations, um, including the Alu International Association, including the Sami Council, all of all of which are um, coastal indigenous um, organizations that represent um, large portions of the population within the within the Arctic, and uh, and so we've been actively uh, working. Uh, as best we can um, throughout this entire process um, from the development and in the creation and back in 2015 from when the Arctic Council said or when CBMP said we want to move forward with uh, a coastal plan um, up and through now and you know hopefully continuing forward to try and continue to engage um, all of our representatives um, kind of kind of broadly but uh, ICC has been a, a pretty critical partner um, and indeed driver um, in 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 many aspects and pulling this together. So I want to you know definitely recognize and and uh, thank thank everyone who's participated for that. But in our in our implementation plan and how we're moving forward, there's sort of five elements that we we've, we've identified to implement this plan. Um, the first one to identify coastal expert network members. The second one to map coastscapes, and I'll talk about what coastscapes are in just a, a minute here, to evaluate and improve our co-production efforts. And this is kind of key. It's an ongoing piece as we continue to try and figure out like where are we making our missteps? How are we you know, fixing those? What are we doing to um, improve what's happening? And then developing the, the knowledge maps. And, and those are elements that we're addressing at the moment. And I'll talk about all of those. And then our, our fifth step is the beginning of the assessments um, as a whole. 
So with the identif identification of the coastal experts, we are we have a coordination group within the US that is reaching out. And that coordination group right now consists of the National Park Service, the Alley International Association, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, Alaska, and NUCA Research providing some support. And participation requests um, have been going out we, uh, to IK holders through community meetings and through presentations that we've been giving. Um, kind of a combination of both, but uh, really the effort right now is focused on IK holders and community meetings. And then with uh, our Western science component, we have participation requests that are really focused on identifying who are um, the university researchers relevant to the species that we're specifically looking at. And I'll talk about those in just a second, um, uh, whether they're university, non-governmental or other federal researchers, we're trying to look and identify who has the, the knowledge about um, what, what are called our focal ecosystem components, which effectively mean what are the species, that's the just the language that, that's being used. So we'll talk about coastscapes really quickly. So mapping our coastscapes. Um, Coastscapes specifically are distinct large scale landforms along the coast that are used for the biodiversity assessments that we'll be conducting because of their distinct biological and ecological processes. And I, and I wanna point out here that initially um, the coast was defined as 30 meters of depth going out off into the marine environment and five parts per thousand salinity or something like that. And um, <laughs> through a lot of discussion and, and definitely through um, our engagement with uh, in, in one of our IK holder meetings that came out as not viable at all um, because it doesn't represent how people really look at the Arctic and that really it's biological and ecological. We had to take a, a bigger picture of, of what was happening. And so we came up with actually a series of seven um, different uh, seven different coastscapes, and they represented fjords, rocky shores and cliffs, lagoons, um, low gradient soft shores, rapidly eroding shores, and estuaries. And then the seventh one is ice fronts. Now we don't really have in the U.S. Arctic fjords, and we don't have in the U.S. Arctic ice fronts. But we do have really functionally the other five. And remember, these are large scale, um, <clears throat> large scale uh, representations of um, the, the biological, ecologically relevant sort of areas. And so as we move forward to try and, and look at that, we've had to consider how do these change? So if, you, if you'll notice here, we have little circles that show um, the seasonality that's associated with what's um, with all of these different areas. So it's, I recognize these are currently summer pictures that we have, but there's a winter components that are there as well. So as we move forward in mapping the coastscapes, we've been able to um, identify initial and secondary close coastscape classifications um, and map for the effectively the entire US Arctic. And that is an initial draft. And these drafts are being taken now to communities to say, hey, does this actually match with what you're seeing? Does it, uh, does it make sense? Is it wrong? Um, because these, in, these initial and secondary um, coastscape classifications were really functionally all done um, through a combination of just uh, computer algorithms and um, a, a handful of people looking through imagery saying, we think this is what this is but the people who live there know what it is. And so now we're taking what we'll call the first draft out and, and having people look at this. And so this is sort of the algorithm um, movement back in al algorithm pieces and parts that were being used. But really the final classification is gonna come down to local knowledge and IK knowledge based on you know, what, what is actually known and available. So, when we take this information out, we can get and look really closely at all these different places. And there may be multiple different options for, for what, it might, what it might look like. And we wanna save that, um, what we'll call the granularity or 
we want to save an ability to be able to kind of zero in on any specific location, but we are also trying to look at what is this in the big scale. So here we might see a very large lagoon system. It's mostly outlined in purple, but we can see there are various different other potential um, descriptions of, of the coast there. And, and as we try and do our assessments, we want to be able to make sure that, you know, we're talking the same language and looking at the same things as we're moving forward. So that's kind of the picture of where we're at with kind of mapping our coastscapes. And the coastscapes begin to be the foundational areas within which we'll do these larger assessments. And as we sort of move forward, one of the things that we've heard, um, especially with our evaluating and improving co-production efforts, is there's a lot of information that's already out there. And we don't want to keep being asked over and over and over again for information that we've already provided. And so one of this um, improvement areas is go look and find what's already out there. And so these are examples of published um, of locations where we've gone to to try and look at or look for published indigenous knowledge so that we can start saying where is the knowledge being held on the different species that we may be looking for. And as we've started to do that, we've been able to say, okay, let's align this knowledge so we can see where do we have um, scientific studies that have been done? Where do we have in indigenous knowledge and, and how do those align on various different aspects of what we are looking for within specific species? And again, our, you know, functionally our species are our focal ecosystem components. So there's kind of language that's, that's going on here. And I just want to make sure that we're we're clear there. And then, with to to try and understand our assessments, we are operating within what are the different attributes that we would care about. So our attributes would be things like phenology, demography, habitat, body condition. And then, how are you going to actually measure that? Those would be our parameters. So that might be migration timing changes or age class distribution changes. And so we're able to start aligning all of these different pieces and parts of knowledge so that we can get at understanding um, who has that knowledge, how, who and how do we bring people to the table so that we can start actually getting to the bottom of, let's do an assessment on what the current state of um, the biodiversity is for an area like a lagoon or an area like a, a rocky shore um, within, within kind of the broader Alaskan area. So with that, we can look at not only what kind of science is available or what kind of indigenous knowledge is available, but we can also look at where is that reference and, you know, how much information do we have? Do we have enough to even, you know, functionally make a, a, an assessment of the various different species? Because some of them, like polar bear, may have a lot. Others, like macroalgae, may not have as much information, but there is information generally there. And as we've been going in and, and digging through the scientific information that is available, um, one of the key reasons for that is so that we can develop these knowledge maps. And the knowledge maps themselves are really focused on identifying where's the information, does it cover the attributes and parameters that we you know, need to understand in order to make assessments, are we missing attributes and parameters and um, that might be valuable that we may need to add in so that we can better understand um, what's happening. Uh, and, and so as we put these bits and pieces of information into a geo database to, to start mapping them, we end up in a situation where there's lots of information all overlapping. It becomes very, very difficult to um, look at just visually and, and, and understand what's happening. And so our current, um, our current methods for moving forward involve um, taking the information that we see in the large geospatial sort of representations and condensing them down into individual points, which can then be looked at on sort of large scale or small scale and can be broken apart into our various different um, focal ecosystem components. So what that might look like is we can look at the available knowledge that we have on a given area based on an FEC. So in this case, we're looking at 
phytoplankton and where are phytoplankton um, studies or knowledge about phytoplankton as a whole, where are they and what parameters might we, might we want to be looking for in, in relation to, in this case, phytoplankton. So essentially we've taken almost a geometric mean or, or, or center and kind of put those onto a map so that we can understand broadly. And then we have sort of some background work that's going on so that as you zoom in, um, you don't lose if say there's a, a study that's going on out in the Bering Sea, but it also kind of continues all the way up and, you know, say through the Bering Strait and North. If you, if you look at this sort of outer picture, it may look like it's not there, but when you zoom in, you'll still see this, this study. And so we've been trying to work on how do we visualize this so that you know it's easy to understand but able to be broken down into smaller pieces so that we can grasp all the different pieces of information where they are. So for instance, if we were to zoom in on one specific area, in this case, um, in the Togiak area, um, we might end up looking for what FECs do we have and we can see that you know we have information on um, anadromous fishes, demersal fishes, um, several different seabirds, dolphins, et cetera, et cetera. But we can zoom that in. And so while in the initial map, it may not look like there's as much in this area, when we zoom in, we're able to actually see and understand. So this information, um, the, the goal is to try and be able to take this information to uh, villages to say, hey, this is what we have. Are we missing information? Is there, you know, additional information that might be out there and available? Um, but with that being said, uh, we've, we've gotten comments back that there are certainly um, some ways to improve and some things that we can do to improve this, which is definitely something that we are looking forward to moving into to understand. But again, the goal is to come back together and be able to say, can we identify all the people that need to be in the room to have a discussion about the state of biodiversity in say rocky shores in this particular area and that is kind of a big goal of the knowledge map so that when we do the assessments we are bringing together the right people um, to, to have discussions and so the next steps as we Kind of sit down and, and say okay we've gotten you know so far we've identified what are we going to look at we've identified you know to some degree what attributes and parameters we need to understand we are working towards identifying who has knowledge where do they have knowledge who can we bring to the table how do we figure this out um, we've gotten uh, moving down the road of developing that expert network we are now having to move into a handful of you know different pieces and parts to get us to the next steps, which are we need to still continue to actively locate scientific research and indigenous knowledge sources and other studies that would be valuable in doing the assessments that we're trying to do. We need to identify gaps and you know see are they really gaps or are they places that we just haven't been able to identify. Um, work that's actually been done um, or identify people who have knowledge about the species in, in these areas or about, you know, these specific pieces, parts, things, um, attributes and parameters that are associated with the different FECs. Um, we need to continue to try and facilitate the gatherings with the IK holders, sometimes to introduce, maybe very specifically, because um, I know there's a lot of, of questions um, that come up, but also to make sure that we're getting the input that we need to be able to move forward and 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 answer some of the larger you know questions that the assessments would hopefully be able to answer can we clarify any perspectives in you know recognizing ik holder knowledge and you know distinctions of different knowledge sources because there are certainly many different knowledge sources and we actually recognize that there are um, about four different knowledge sources that we recognize within CBMP, which include also um, outside of scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge, there's also local knowledge um, that we've 
certainly been been using in various um, in, in various different ways. Can we talk about? We need to kind of get a better grip on how we are visualizing the data, and as we move farther and farther down the road of co-production of knowledge, um, being able to you know functionally represent this information in a way that everyone can agree on is, is certainly a, a question that we want to make sure that we're addressing and we need to keep having those community discussions um, moving forward so that everyone is aware of where our progress is um, any additional like desire to participate and developing broad support for the project as a whole and then lastly you know kind of identifying those funding sources and figuring out how we can continue to make sure that we can be equitable in how we move forward um, and, and continue engagement, but in, continue engagement in an equitable way um, for everyone. And all of that, as we kind of reassess on an ongoing basis, where are we, where are we successful in our, you know, co-production efforts where are we not successful where are we failing where are we where do we need to improve how do we need to you know functionally modify what we're doing um, to be moving forward in a way that is beneficial all the way around and so we you know <laughs> we make steps sometimes we have to back up and say let's let's look at this again um, but that's but that's sort of the the picture of of where we've been been moving and, and all of it to try and you know get a get a picture of what the state of biodiversity is and create the best available knowledge of the state of biodiversity so that you know everyone can have that assessment and and use that um, as as is appropriate and as they as as has seen fit for for all so that's kind of the picture of of where we are and what we've done I know there are a lot of things that have been left out of my description there but i i yeah i i just want to you know again there's been a lot of people that have been involved it's an ongoing process that has been moving forward for well since 2015 so for several years and a lot of good effort by by a lot of a lot of people um we've had many many meetings most of the meetings uh have all um i think been ultimately very productive in moving us forward and and continuing to keep uh continuing to improve the process of of engagement and making sure that people who have knowledge are able to be in the room and participating in the discussions as we yeah, as we move forward. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I know there's probably many questions that are out there. Um, so I'll say thank you to both Katanek and to Kathy for their participation in this presentation and open it up for any questions um, that, that anybody may wanna ask. So I'll stop there and our contact info is down at the bottom if there are more questions that we can't answer here, but I'll leave the time to to everyone else to ask questions and we'll see if we can answer them. Thank you so much, Taze and Dinak and Kathy. Um, Taze, if you want to take your slides down so everyone can see each other. Um, and if everyone could do a, a virtual round of applause, first of all, for our speakers, uh, whether you want to do it on camera or use the little hand clappy function um and yeah if anyone has questions or comments you can either put them in the chat and i can read them out loud if you have an anonymous question you can chat it directly to me and i will read it without your name uh, or you can raise your hand and come off mute and, and ask directly uh, and i'll also just note while people are, are typing or thinking about their those questions um ben you did get some compliments on your slides uh, and also, I just want to uh, emphasize what Kana said in the chat, which is having indigenous participation from the get go is really crucial. So good to, to stress that point. Thank you. Appreciate it.
And we got a, a question that came directly to me asking if you all can elaborate on the distinctions between the different knowledge systems that Taze mentioned. Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. Thank you for asking that very important question. And it is a very important question. Um, the different perspectives from Indigenous and non-Indigenous regarding Indigenous knowledge and science, we may be looking at the exact same thing. I'm going to use a harpoon tip for an example. Uh, a harpoon tip is made from ivory, or traditionally made from ivory, and carved from a harder material. Uh, from a Western perspective, because my background is in biology, I may be approaching it and looking at it and saying, what are the dimensions of, of such an item? And what is the angle of the, the blade or the, um, the chipped part where it would pierce to the skin of a walrus or, or a whale? And what is it made of? And why is it designed in such a manner? I mean, those are typical Western academics questions to understand the composition through an iterative process and, and why it was effective. From an indigenous perspective, an indigenous knowledge perspective, indigenous people will look at the harpoon and they will see exactly those types of um, questions that you're looking for or seeking those answers. But also we would look at the indigenous harpoon, the traditional harpoon and mark it so that we know where it's from, who, the, who it belongs to. And if it was ever lost, we would return it. But we also see the harpoon tip and where it came from and what it provided to uh, the community and to the family and, and to other surrounding communities the other through barter. So it would affect the indigenous economics and the health and wellness of being able to provide for our community members in either providing food for ourselves, but then also sharing with the other community members and those that can't provide for themselves as well. And from that same species, and we talk about walrus, the hide would have been processed to ensure that it could be used for other items, let's say maybe an omiak, for example. And that Omiak would have provided transportation for the community or the hunters or the indigenous knowledge holders. But also the intestines would have been, or even the stomach would have been used to craft an item to celebrate um, the catch or the walrus or could celebrate um, something specific and people gathering and celebrating. And so that, that stomach would have been used to create a drum. And that drum would have been practiced through, been used for a practice of spirituality, not in the aspects of religion, but for us as a people and really celebrating where we come from. And that's through the land or for that first fly that I had, you know it, no not, and, and how we are a part of the ecosystem. But also, we would also understand through the stomach contents of the walrus, the clams and what the walrus was eating and where it might have been eating. And if there was something distinct or unique that would have um, been found in those stomachs from the clams, you know, what's, are the clams healthy, which would affect the health of the walrus, which would also affect the health of us as Inuit as part of the ecosystem. And those clams would have siphoned out in the benthic layer, um, the various plankton and you know, other microorganisms in, in that area. And they would also be affected by um, those types of food sources. Uh, but then those same food sources for the clam would have affected the uh, other organisms, the, the smaller organisms. And then those would have been eaten by krill, and then those would have been eaten by the whale, which would affect the health of the whale as well. And that whale would have gone back and provided itself to whale hunters, let's say maybe in the North Slope. And it's this different perspective that we have from indigenous knowledge to Western science that we're looking at the same thing, but we're also processing it in other means, in other manners. And this is the approach that we're taking um, for the coastal monitoring plan in how to assess the Arctic from an Inuit perspective. 
in considering the various impacts that are being um, that are causing or driving the different uh, dimensions and drivers, or in this case, the um, parameters and attributes that are listed uh, that Taze explained. And when we assess the Arctic, we're taking all these different aspects into account. And I hope that explains um, and answers your question. I can I can follow up a little bit too because that was you know thank you um, that was a, a great explanation um, but there I think there was another piece of that question um, and and that is um, kind of I think a more more broad piece of that so there's the four types of knowledge that I kind of mentioned and and Katana answered very well about two of those. Um, the other, the other two are community-based monitoring um, and local knowledge. And so local knowledge um, would be akin to like, I'll just call it captain, you know, vessel captains who are commercial fishermen that may be going out and gathering information uh, um, because they're out kind of regularly in the ocean in the way that they're commercial fishing, gathering information that is distinctly different um, and, and can be brought in as well. And then there's community-based monitoring that is monitoring work that's been established um, within a, a community kind of broadly that's, that's bringing information in that may have been designed by anyone um, that is kind of an ongoing monitoring effort. And sometimes those can, well, I, yeah, I'll back up and say that those four knowledge types were identified broadly across the entire circumpolar Arctic. And, and so there are, there are distinctions that come in for local knowledge and community-based monitoring that we have to recognize um, kind of that are that are very distinct from but may but may over I, I say very distinct but may overlap a lot with indigenous knowledge or may overlap a lot with scientific knowledge but they're just being done in very different in different ways so I think there's that kind of element that is also there that we need to recognize also. So, thanks. Thank you both for that answer. Uh, Kena, go ahead. Thank you, Katanek and Taje and uh, Catherine for this awesome presentation. Um, and I really appreciate uh, what you chose to focus on in your answering it, but also in your presentation. Um, I'm interested in equitable Arctic research and especially in this area of um, how thinking holistically about community-based monitoring activities um, and, and you know, this incorporation from the get-go of indigenous communities, how that can inform or actually combat things like siloing uh, when it comes to research activities, um, like taking this more holistic approach can actually lead to better science and outcomes. Um, if you would love, to, if you would be willing to share about some of the, your experiences. I don't know if you want to take a crack at it, but I could probably help answer the question. Yeah, go for it. Thank you for asking that very important question, uh, Anna. Very nice to see you as well. Um, to really understand. Um, and answer your question and how indigenous knowledge and science working together could help provide a, a more broadened perspective and holistically assessing the Arctic. And one of our discussions and one of the facilitated gatherings that ICC had in, in the North Slope and Utiab specifically, one of the main aspects in looking at the knowledge tables or the different parameters and attributes, more specifically within FinFish, um, the commercial 
fishing industry and the scientists that um, look at population health and population dynamics for finfish, you often use um, numbers to justify the, the quotas and the bycatch. Many of our indigenous knowledge holders indicated that the Western approach or the Western economic approach of utilizing populations of fish to determine its health brought up the, the aspect or the concern that it doesn't really justify or equitably um, assess the Arctic because indigenous economics are important. Like I mentioned earlier in the sharing of the walrus meat to provide to the communities. For that concern to be raised and having that tribute singly out there um, speaks kind of to the equitable approaches that we're taking in this plan's approach in applying a food security lens and having indigenous knowledge core to the to the plan itself as a platform in moving forward and hopefully with the evolution of the plan itself. So indigenous economics needs to be properly represented, equitably represented within the parameters and attributes, not just for finfish, but across all different species to really have that holistic approach and that holistic assessment of the Arctic from an Inuit perspective, utilizing the food security conceptual framework. Um, and that's one of ICC's publications. And thank you for asking that question. I hope that answers it. And I'll just um, tack on, I think that was a fantastic answer. So thank you, Katana. And, and I'll just tack on from a, from a Western science perspective, it can be extremely, um, I'll just say eye-opening to have discussions that that allow you to, to kind of recognize that, that whole picture because you're almost trained from the very beginning to like slice and dice and chop and, and um, look at things in a very compartmentalized way. And so having these kinds of discussions on a ongoing basis I think really pushes pushes you to say, well, wait a minute, maybe these divisions don't work quite as well as we had hoped that they would, and that um, uh, uh, that it is better to be. We say holistic, and we talk about systems, and then we break the systems apart from the rest of the systems. <laughs> so, so it it really it really helps in in thinking, yeah, very much more broadly about kind of a lot, I'll just, I don't know a better way to say it than kind of a lot. <laughs> so, thank you. Thanks, Tana, for that question. Uh, and to Katunak and Taze for the answers. We've got, I think, time for one more question and I've gotten one more via the chat. And that's uh, whether the speakers can say more about why the assessments are being done or might be done. You know, is the need for assessment being driven by government needs? Is it because there are development projects proposed uh, or is it other reasons? Yeah, so so I'll take that one. Um, and I think the very quick answer, and this is not going to do the answer any justice at all, but I will try. Um, <clears throat> that is that there was actually a series of questions that came up. And one of them was to try and create more connectivity. So a lot of decisions are being made at the, you know, these large international levels and they've lost the communities. And, and so one of the goals is to say, can we create assessments that will be valuable locally to allow people to be able to, you know, whether it's, yeah, to allow people to be able to understand how the changes that they're seeing are kind of in the context of the greater like circumpolar. Are we seeing a change just here or is this change something that's happening? So you put everything into context of the, the broader picture, but we need it to be valuable locally 
And so a lot of the assessments we're hoping are designed to be valuable locally so that, you know, say there's actions that are taking place or that are potentially taking place, we can have the best available information to, you know, work with however those developments may be moving forward and whatever that development may be. And I'm not saying that it's an on the ground something or an on the water something, but just progress in whatever form you want to take that. Um, we want to be able to make sure that, and the goal is to make sure that there is a whole picture of what's happening and not a fragmented picture of what's happening based on, you know, a handful of science uh, work that's been done that might be in one season or might be um, in the limited spatial area or any of those number of restrictions that might be on. We want to try and pull all that information together so that when actions are taking place, whatever those actions may be, we have a, a full picture. And when I say we, I mean villages, I mean local governments, I mean any any way that you look at we have a full picture so that we can make the best decisions because for better or worse or however we want to look at it, the Arctic is changing and that change is going to bring more changes and we can do what we can to try and work together to, <laughs> to in some way do our best to hopefully. I can build off of that as well from the hope of this project and the final assessment within the various scales, international, national, regional, and the indigenous community level. Um, the intent is to identify those knowledge gaps, but also when that assessment occurs, to have research priorities determined by at the indigenous community level to address the needs of indigenous peoples. Um, this is an example I've had recently from a discussion. There was a someone who told me that a priority from displaced from the Arctic is to study pollinators, to study bees, because it would be cool. And the response or a reflective response was, but what is that? How does that help indigenous peoples in their communities when they're seeing um, fish die off in the rivers? I mean, studying bees is, is might not be a priority for indigenous peoples, but studying fish would be a priority. Studying migratory whales and what's happening with their migration changes, that's a priority that could be identified and be directly sourced from an indigenous community, from indigenous knowledge holders who are observing and monitoring every day and living um, and practicing food security every day. Thank you. And I realize we're now past the top of the hour, so I am gonna wrap us up, but I just, once again, I want to thank Kathy and Taze and Katunak for a really wonderful presentation and thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, for asking some great questions. This has been recorded, so it'll be posted on my Arabic collaborations and on our um, YouTube channel by the end of the week. So if you missed part of it and want to uh, pick up that part, you'll be able to, or if you want to share it with colleagues. Um, and otherwise, we hope to see you again soon at a future webinar. So thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>